Hello everyone, this is Alice in Beijing. Nice to see you on IKX Talks this Friday. Actually, this was a really great program since April. Till now, it's already 100 days. So in last 100 days, you know, 15 weeks, so we have a lot of speakers on stage. So this was the first 10 speakers on the stage. So they from different part of the world, they talk about their latest research, and they deliver wonderful talk. So and another group is for the students. They have, you know, uh, did very hard work after each talk. So they write the technical report. So for each speaker, we write the uh, report, technical report, and publish the next Monday. So this was the first way, uh, first the ten, you know, speakers, the first the ten, you know, technical report. Then uh, following, we have next, you know. Four weeks, yeah, we have 11 speakers on the stage, and then we have all this uh, student to help finish next 11, you know, uh, technical reports. All these are really popular. So in last 100 days, you know, all these people were really working hard, and this was the second group. The second, the third group, they write the technical report, and all these speakers deliver wonderful talk. So in last 15 weeks, we already have you know, uh, 31 speakers on the stage. And uh, this week will be a new start. We will start a new session. This is for the next 10 speakers on this stage. And they will deliver wonderful, wonderful talks. And all these talks will cover in many different fields. And uh, today was a new day. Today was a new start. Why today is a new start so special, not only for these speakers, it's also from all these topics. And and today was a big day for light. Although the aft stage was already cheered up, was light up. Because the, today, this week, the IKX task is collaborated with light, science and applications, this wonderful top, top journal. And uh, they did a wonderful job in the last, uh, you know, five or six years. Became the top three, you know, the journal in the light, uh, in the light part, uh, field. So this journal was, uh, our best friend and we working together and uh, today is the first time we deliver the talk on this you know with the laser because this year uh, was the uh, 60 years anniversary of laser so um, tonight we will have this special topic light the world and celebrate the 60 anniversary of laser we invited three speakers all these speakers was from German from China and from US so they respect for different areas of laser research and technology. And uh, uh, we also invited another famous scientist, you know, to be our guest host is Professor Yongfeng Lu. So he is going to host the speakers and he is going to, you know, host for the part of the question and answers. So uh, the first speaker will be from uh, German. Is a big title, you know, in uh, not only in the laser field, it's almost everywhere. And uh, Yongfeng, uh, Professor Yongfeng Lo was from University of uh, Nebraska, uh, Lincoln. He's going to be the session chair for this wonderful talk. Now, uh, Professor Yongfeng, is your turn. Yeah, the stage is yours. Please. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, uh, for the time. Okay. And uh, I really appreciate, you know, uh, the introduction by Professor Bai Yuhong uh, from Light. For me to uh, be involved in this wonderful uh, uh, webinar uh, event, and so you know, I'm a fan of uh, Professor Alice Chan, and Alice has been really successful in the research, and also I think it's a uh, wonderful to uh, uh, um, development to uh, build such a uh, successful and a popular uh, webinar series through the uh, I uh, Can X platform. So it's my great pleasure here to uh, to uh, Help uh, uh, Alice to um, uh, uh, share the uh, a few uh, wonderful talks. So today we have three uh, very distinguished speakers, and the first one is Professor Dieter Bimberg, and uh, he will be talking about uh, the green data communication, the next challenges after 5G. We just had had a small uh, in a short chat, and he will be is talking about 50G. So 5G is kind of a uh, you know what's going on, and he will give us a uh, Things what's uh, what's going to happen in the future, and uh, uh, that's a very uh, uh, 
brief introduction of uh, our uh, speaker, uh, Prof. Bimberg. Um, he is now a, a leading research uh, is a center for the um, joint um, uh, director of joint center at uh, Chan Chui Institute of Optics, uh, Mechanics, and Physics uh, of uh, Chinese uh, Academy of Science, and also he's a professor at uh, Technical University of Berlin. And so, just uh, uh, for your information, and uh, Professor Lindberg received his PhD from uh, uh, Goethe University, Frankfurt, Germany. And he had a principal science position at the Max Planck Institute for Solid State uh, Research, and, uh, uh, which is in uh, Grenoble, France, until 1979. And also, he served as professor of electric engineering at the Technical University of Aachen, also Germany. And uh, he uh, became chair of applied solid state physics at the Technical University of Berlin. And he is the founding director of the Center of Nanophotonics. And uh, he has been a uh, guest professor at uh, a few uh, very famous international universities. One is Technion uh, uh, Haifa, which is Israel, and UC Santa Barbara at, the, uh, at uh, California. And also, um, he also had uh, some, uh, 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 hold some position at Hewlett Packard in Palo Alto, uh, California. And he was uh, uh, the distinguished uh, adjunct professor at uh, uh, KAU uh, between um, 2012 and 2018. And uh, from uh, two years ago, he became a uh, director of the Bimberg Chinese German Center for Green Photonics, uh, which is uh, uh, located in the Chinese Academy of Science at the Science in Changchun. So, um, Professor Bimberg is very well achieved as a pioneer in this area. He has received numerous awards and recognitions. Probably I will take too much time to go through all his uh, uh, very um, uh, renowned uh, achievements in his career. But just a few, he is uh, the uh, members of uh, German Academy of Science, an EU Academy of Science, and a foreign me member of a Russian Academy of Science and US uh, Academy of, Academy of Engineering. So even the one of them can, you know, say, uh, can reflect his uh, leading position. But he holds holds many of them, probably you know, uh, like a, a 20, 30. So I won't uh, go through in details. So without further delay, I'd like to invite Professor Bimberg to start his talk. So um, uh, Peter, please go ahead. It's your, it's your time. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. Today, I'm talking to you from Riga, which is another place in Eastern Europe. And it is the capital of the state of Latvia, which became inter-independent after the decay of Soviet Union, one of the three Baltic countries. And I was traveling this morning from Lithuania another of these three Baltic countries to Riga. And I'm talking to you from one of the hotels in Riga. And I would like to thank you so much for the introduction, for the kind introduction. So we will uh, merge in this presentation a number of uh, challenges we are seeing after 5G. And we will go very much into detail. And, uh, but first of all, I would like the first slide, I would like to introduce my center in Changchun, where I have the honor to work. This is an international team in Changchun focusing on uh, quantum technologies, including high bit rate and energy efficient vertical cavity surface lasers for optical computer internet connects. And that is the subject of my presentation today. But we're also working on long wavelengths, quantum dot Hibi laser technology. That is a technology which is patented for next generation automotive LIDAR. We are working for future terabit per second metro communication on mode lock quantum dot lasers and semiconductor optical amplifiers. And in including each case, 
uh, nanostructure growth, device processing, and module development. Now, the contents of this presentation is a glimpse first on 60 years history of lasers. Then I will talk about the internet predictions and the reality of unpredictable demand. I will introduce the definition of hyper data centers, tell you that cows are not laying eggs, each application needs its own design. And finally, I go into details and show you energy efficient photonic and electronic design for a sustainable future. And the next revolution in de device design is coming. What is coming in the next five or six or seven years? That will be the last part of my presentation. Now a glimpse on 60, 60 years history of lasers. 1916, Einstein presented the theory of stimulated emission. It took until 1960 that Basov from Moscow Russian Academy of Sciences and Ball and Thomas proposed the semiconductor laser actually a few months only after the presentation of the Ruby laser by Maiman. So the proposal of the semiconductor laser was early. Basov received the Nobel Prize. 1962, Alferov, not from Moscow, but from St. Petersburg and Damke from IBM, reported the first homojunction lasers operating at four Kelvin pulsed. In the following years, Actually, Alferov at least had a very hard time in Russia because people were telling him lasers working at only at four Kelvin are absolutely useless and he is spending the money of the people for doing things which are useless. Well, today we know better. 1963, he and Herbert Krömer, a German today working in Santa Barbara, suggested double hetero structures instead in not homojunction lasers. It took five years until Alferov was the first to develop and to show double heterojunction lasers now operating at 300 Kelvin, but still pulsed. Two years later, he reported the first world first semiconductor laser operating at continuous wave. We together, Alferov and myself, showed the first quantum red lasers 24 years later and in the year 2000, Alferov and Krömer received the Nobel Prize for suggesting 1963 the double heterostructure laser. So it took 37 years that this invention was recognized by the Nobel Committee, Prize Committee. So really make your inventions early because you have to wait a little. Now today, no semiconductor laser would mean no internet, no data centers, and many, many other things also. For example, here, the mouse, or at a, a, a center where you uh, 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 put in your money. Now, here's a picture which I was taking in the year 2000 of Alferov, the Swedish king, Alferov's wife, the queen, and here is Herbert Gromer. He was a fortunate one because he had the two daughters of the, of the royal family. Now let's, uh, after having touched briefly the history low, let's go to the internet predictions and the reality of unpredictable demand. In 2015, five years ago, Cisco predicted an lar a large increase of internet use and published this graph here going from 2014 to close to 2020, the total internet traffic, traffic. And the statement was in 2019, the total, total traffic by internet will be three times larger than 2014, which was thought in 2015, that is a very large increase. Unfortunately, this prediction was completely surprised by reality. It was wrong. For example, streaming or blockchain chain were not yet existing and were missing in Cisco's prediction. Traffic growth is much larger than predicted and we have continuously emerging applications. The question is, which one is the next? 
we have actually, that is uh, true, a 60% increase per year or a hundred times in 10 years. And we do not know actually which are the next ones. We know now connected cars, autonomous driving will use a lot of internet. Now let's look at, for example, blockchain, which did not exist 2015. The total electricity consumption of inhabitants worth of that of blockchain data centers. Blockchain worldwide consumes, last year consumed 70.3 terawatt hours, causing an emission of 34 megaton CO2. Denmark consumes 35 terawatt hours by population, but 30 terawatt hours by data centers. So that was last year. This year, data centers have certainly surpassed what population is using up. Iceland, a very small country, using 700 gigawatt hours for the population, 840 gigawatt hours by data centers. Today, it's much, much more. These data are from 2017. Now, Bitcoin. Blockchain, 50% of the worldwide Bitcoin firms are in China. Now let's focus a little on China. Blockchain in China, 2020 to 2022. Presently, cryptocurrencies are banned, but a blockchain service network is launched now, maintained by the government. Supposed to reduce the cost and also the power consumption by 80% as compared to status quo, mm -hmm. following President Xi, who declared blockchain a national priority on October 21st last year. He expects that in 200 cities, there are notes end of 2020, he expects that via blockchain, 26 border crossings are monitored and that blockchain, the national blockchain might eat up WeChat, Alipay and become the central di digital currency and payment system. And similar efforts are spearheaded by Australia, the European Union and in United States, private companies like IBM and Facebook. All these data were actually published a few months ago in IEEE Spectrum in April 20. Now application two, streaming and social interaction. That is a visit to the museum. That is a day at the beach, out on an intimate date, and finally the wedding night. These are streaming and social interactions. We could follow Einstein who was saying, I fear the day that technology will surpass our human interaction. The world will have a generation of idiots. So let's try not becoming idiot. Actually, uh, yesterday I was talking to a young man, 17 years old, a German. He told me until he finished school, he was reading altogether five or six books, not more. The rest he does via the internet. I am skeptical whether this is really a foundation of our future. And now let's go to another application, streaming and connected cars. The total elect electricity consumption of streaming is 350 terawatt hours. And it's causing an emission of 170 megaton CO2. Now let's go look to, to what is going to come. One connected car produces three to five gigabyte per second or 10 terabyte per day. Actually, uh, companies are talking to me because we're working very much on high speed or high bit rate interconnects. Companies are talking to me, not about three to five gigabyte per second, but about 25, because they believe in automotive, you will need much more. Presently, the internet total power consumption is 8 to 10% of world power production. 
and following Greenpeace in November 2019, and actually presently streaming dominates. But uh, automotive might take over in three, four years' time when that is completely introduced. So what we need is a worldwide initiative for green IT. And actually we were my, my center in Berlin where I stayed until two years ago was one of the pioneers of green photonics. And we received three times the green photonics award from SPIE in February of each year in San Francisco. Now, where does all that power go? Communication via processing. In data centers, the traffic flow is changing from inbound, outbound to st server storage inside. One kilobyte inbound creates 930 kilobyte demand internally. And the same is true for high performance computing. I do not need to touch that separately because all that what I'm saying about data centers applies for supercomputers. Yeah, the ratio is identical to data centers. Hyper data centers. The number of hyper data centers is more than doubling within five years. Here you see between 2015 and 2020. And uh, it uh, started increase 21%. Between 19 and 20, we had an increase by 47%. And that second uh, graph here shows you that in all cases, the inter or intra data center traffic is a dominating one. That is the most important message. So the cost of powering and cooling a server is now comparable to the cost of buying the server hardware. The present challenge is taking care of all the needs of the increasing 60% per year use is achieve larger trend, data transmission rates, 100 to 400 gigabit per second, it's simultaneously less energy per bit, less than 100 femtochild per bit across, let's say, two kilometers. Otherwise, if we do not achieve that goal, data center use will be restricted and the use of your iPhones, for example, the data rates, which you can use for pulling down movies will be restricted. But these demands from point of view of a physicist contradict each other, and we need to find compromises. Now let's look what we can do and what we're presently doing. Most important is each application needs its own type of laser. There is not one universal laser which can be applied to any application. And what we need is development of energy efficient both photonic and electronic device design. We need to merge both types of design for a sustainable future. Now, most commercial lasers today are quantum well lasers. Quantum dot lasers are coming and we have a diversity, diversity of mainstream material families, nitrites, arsenides, phosphides, interband, intraband, edge emitters, surface emitters. Here is on the left-hand side an edge emitter, on the right-hand side a surface emitter. Now nitrites are well known to all of you because our LEDs are based today on nitrites. The intercontinental traffic is based on phosphides, 1.55 micrometer emitting lasers, and that mouth is based on arsenides. Now for the traffic inside computer centers, we use lasers based on arsenides. Now here is an edge emitting laser on my thumb, still relatively large. If I put a, a, a very good surface emitting laser, I, you wouldn't see it on my thumb anymore. That is a picture taken by electron microscope. You see here a bar, 30 micrometer. And here you see in the center, this red circle is the area where the light is emitted. 
Now, the device structures which we use are very, very complex. Typically, 50 different types of layers of different composition of different materials, complex processing in clean rooms. You use so-called oxide operators. Here is a cavity which consists is consisting of quantum welds or quantum dots. That is the active area. The cavity is between these mirrors. You have here typically peat contact that is called the top mesa. The N-doped distributed black brack reflector, and here is a substrate end. And we have double mesa structures for better heat dissipation, reduce capacitance for using multi-oxide operators. And we want to have high differential gain. We want to have low resistance, and we want to have a reduced parasitic capacitance uh, in order to reduce the losses, uh, losses which are introduced by parasitic capacitance. Now, we have for different distances, we need different lasers at different wavelengths. What we presently use in uh, data centers are rec to rec since about four to five years, between one meter and 1,000 meters. Coming is interreg, dense parallel. Dense parallel means pixel arrays, which are also going to be used in automotive, but at different wavelengths, not the same wavelengths. The same arrangement, but different, different wavelengths. Under development are intraboard, module to module, and chip to chip, 2023 or later. And the future is probably nano lasers having a diameter of less than microme one micrometer here. And uh, everything is going to be silicon photonics. And that picture is from a joint uh, work we have undertaken with the University of Illinois in Urbana Ch Champaign with a group of uh, the late Chun Ling Chuang. And similar work is ongoing and the Ning team at uh, Tsinghua University presently. And we are again working together. Now, how does an optical link look like, a rec to rec link in a data center? It's based on lasers and it's based on pixels. And uh, what you really transmit are such bits, yes, or no, a one or a zero. It's so-called large signal modulation. And what you see here is so-called PEM2 between a zero level and a one level. And it's called NRZ, non-return to zero. That is the, and these are so-called eye diagrams. Now, what is very important is the bit rate, which is the number of transmitted bit per time and the energy to data ratio EDR, it's just the total power, input power divided by the bit rate. I is the drive current and the voltage. Of course, you have to add the modulation energy and that should be also FEM to child per bit, but it is not. We'll come back to that point a little later because the driver electronics not only leads to additional power consumption, but presently to more power consumptions than the laser. And another number is so-called spectral efficiency. Small signal response is that curve here, where you solve the single mode rate equation leading to the transfer function. And I do not want to teach tonight theoretical physics, but I just want to tell you that these lasers can be modeled with this rate equation. And in the modeling of these rate equations, there appears one parameter, gamma, and that parameter, together with a number of other parameters, is a damping. And we have the differential gain, which I have mentioned before, the active volume, And the bandwidth, modulation, current efficiency factor, and spectral efficiency are again uh, mentioned here. And that is one of the important parameters. So which laser design is the best for a given application? 
what we do is uh, what we do in Changchong, we vary the technology, we vary the geometry to find that out. We have designed masks with 16 different oxide upper to diameter pixels in each column. And we have 256 different pixel types, single or multi mode, on such a segment. Yeah, which you see here. Here is a top meso diameter changed from 18 to 32. So bottom meso diameter from 18 to 62. And of course, we have to ask each other how fast can we characterize these lasers? This takes a horrible amount of time and it will not help a lot if we do not characterize fast. And that's what we're doing. We are characterizing these lasers fast. We have developed a technology to do with computer based uh, software and a novel hardware system, which we have uh, developed in Germany and transferred to Changchung, this development that we can characterize not before like. 1,000 lasers in weeks, but 10,000 lasers in hours. That is most important in order to adapt your design to demands. You must be fast. Otherwise, you're not winning the market. Now, a second technology variation next to changing the geometries is varies the photon lifetime. Now, photon lifetime is related to this gamma, which I mentioned before. Here, it's linear. It's just uh, proportional to the photon lifetime. Photon lifetime is a lifetime of a photon inside of the pixel cavity. And that can be changed via the power reflectance. You change the power reflectance. So you change the mirror losses. You change the photon lifetime or the damping, whatever you like better. And that is a way to change the bandwidth. That is a novel way. And here I show you just coming once, once only once to a detail, the power reflectance. We added silicon nitride material on the top of a pixel. And you see how you can modulate the reflectance. Here you put it on top of here. And you can measure at various uh, deposition thicknesses of this material. You can measure the, the bandwidth or the output power. And by changing, for example, from 188 nanometer silicon nitride to 87 nanometer silicon nitride, so we are in the nano area, we change the output power by a factor of two. And uh, that is just showing you how things are varying irregularly when you change the deposition of this uh, layer of silicon nitride. Now, what we need is, or what we are developing, our new strategy for significant life, life cycle cost reduction. And the question today is, if we want to go to 200 gigabit per second, and that is one of the next goals of IEEE standardization, Shall we do that by four times 50 gigabit per second or by eight times 25 gigabit per second? Now, each time we change the bit rate, we must change the technology. And that is shown in this graph versus the EDR, which I have defined before. The energy per bit yeah, is for small, and for large photon lifetime shown as a function of bit rate. And you see that if you work at small bit rates up to about around 40 gigabit per second, you have an advantage if you work with small photon lifetime. And here is a crossover. And if you go, let's say to 50 gigabit per second, our lasers do more than that. You do not break with large photon lifetimes, but with small ones. You go down from here to here, yeah? But for a system designer, the question is, of course, do you want to, want to break with four times 50 or eight times 25? And the difference is 75% in energy 
and the current density goes in energy uh, you spend and the current density goes down from 25 kiloamps per square centimeter to 10 kiloamps per square centimeter, you reduce by 60%. And that means the lifetime of the devices is instead of a few years, probably 20 or 30 or 50 years. And that is a real system advantage because the people who are working with data centers do not want to change their lasers. So large energy efficiency means low power consumption and less cooling, low current density means large device reliability. And all that ends in a reduction of life cycle cost. So for pixels at large bit, bit rates, we will do large cavity peak, gain peak detuning, a subject I was not discussing today, and low damping rates. From pixels at medium bit rates, you will have small cavity gain, peak detuning, and large damping rate. Joint optimization of temperature stability, energy consumption, and bit rate is possible for any bit rate. And that is one of the messages of this presentation for everybody who is listening today. So what are the results for what I call classical pixels? Lifetimes are typically now 20 years. We can go from micrometers to one or two kilometers. We are below 100 femtojoule per bit for the optical device. We have a very high efficiency. I have reached in my laboratory uh, about 55 gigabit per second on off keying per channel, high speed or high data rate. And we have a very good temperature stability between minus 20 and 85 degrees. That is true for all single or multi-mode lasers between 850 and 1060 nanometers. And you can now start to adapt the wavelengths to your application. But we still need more capacity. And next step is wavelength division multiplexing. If you look inside to this workstation of IBM, built by IBM, where is the room for 10 times more fiber if you want to go from 25 to 250 or 400 megabit per second? We have to increase the capacity and reach of multimode fiber links. We have to reduce the need for parallel cables. There is just no space. We need to develop low cost and power efficient solutions, including driver, receiver, and novel fiber design. And we are working in Changchung, in my center in Changchung, both with American, yes, surprise, surprise, and Chinese companies on novel fiber design and help them to de develop novel fibers. That is a typical uh, wavelength division multiplexing system. You have a transceiver, wavelengths lambda 1 to lambda 4. You have a multiplexer. You go in a multi-mode fiber. Have a demultiplexer and you have re, you have receivers. So the present uh, standard on which we are based and uh, for which we're developing uh, lasers is uh, using eight fifteen four types of wavelengths between eight fifty and nine forty nine forty nanometers. That is the IEEE standard eight hundred two point three. And the lasers which we presently have deliver 45 gigabit per second. That means with these laser lasers, we can transmit 200, more than 200 gigabit per second. Or if we go to so-called pulse amplitude modulation four, uh, we can transmit 400 megabit per second. Here is an eye. Yeah, and here is what I mentioned, 200 plus gigabit per second across a single multi-mode fiber. Now, this picture you have seen before, we need this joint optimization. Now, the system designer have to ask each other, do you say want to have four optimized lasers, let's say at 50 gigabit PEM2 or 100 gigabit, gigabit PEM4 at these wavelengths, or do they want to double the number of wavelengths 
to eight operates them only at 25 gigabit per second and save somehow somewhere between 75 and 60 percent of the energy and reduce appreciably the current density. These are questions which must be answered by system designers. I'm a simple physicist and device engineer, and I cannot answer this question. Now, just to give you a glimpse how difficult the life for us today is, standardization groups are telling us what we should do for DWDM, single mode fibers, automotive, short reach fiber task force. <coughs> for each of these areas, we have task force designing or giving the preconditions pre for what is called physical layer. Uh, and that is a picture from IEEE and uh, there are various um, task force they have for sub, uh, subgroups for the various applications we have today in the internet area for, for our surface emitting lasers. Now let's go in the last part of my presentation to the next revolution in, in device design, which is definitely going to come. A third technology variation is replace the top mirror by surface nanostructures. High contrast grating, a subject which was developed for many, many, many years by a friend of mine, Connie Cheng Hasnain at Berkeley, who has also a company in Shenzhen. And by Anqin Liu, who is now a professor at the Institute of Semiconductors of the Chinese Academy of Sciences of, in Beijing. And these pictures are from a joint publication. If that would work, you could simplify actually the design of the, of the laser. You get an increased confinement factor, you have polarization selection, and that means you can double the number of bits by just using both polarizations, which are rectangular to the cross axis. You have very good mode selection, larger oxide aperture, which means larger output power and a reduced series resistance. Promising, but not yet proven. Higher speed, larger energy efficiency, larger output power, and thus longer distance. These are the challenges of the next two or three years. And here is picture, scanning electron microscope picture and a, a, a cross section, how such, such a, a HCG high contrast rating looks like. Now, next is the driver issue. For each laser, you need a driver. The goal for power consumption is complete optical interconnect, much less than one picojoule per bit hopefully 100 femtojoule, yeah, like the Vixel done by us. Presently, people are using 65 CMOS, 65 nanometer CMOS. And the best result, but not yet mixed with the laser was 0.56 picojoule per bit at 56 gigabit per second. Big MOS is much worse, 3.2 picojoule per bit. Now we are starting a cooperation to use eight nanometer CMOS. And we do hope that we come down yeah, to the desired values. Presently, none of the big circuit developers focuses on ultra energy efficient ultra fast CMOS. We work with two with three groups, one in China, one with IBM Zurich, and actually one at my university in Berlin. And finally, silicon photonics. We must put our lasers on the drivers, but there is a size mismatch. Currently, most of semiconductor lasers are much larger than transistors by a factor of 100 to 1000. A typical semiconductor laser has 10 to 100 square millimeters, or still, if you talk about pixels, you are talking about, let's say, uh, 50 times 50, 2,500 
square micrometers. Now, a typical SRAM size is 300 nanometers squared. That means we have to integrate such a big tower with a transistor, put them down here. Now, nanoscale lasers are key components in integration of electronics and photonics side by side. And novel transfers will be definitely based on high frequency CMOS instead of silicon germanium big mass. And that is one picture of some development we have done with, with, together with the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. These are metal cavity surface emitting lano lasers, which are deposited on silicon. They have 1% of the footprint of present pixels, substrate free, flexibility in transfer, microwatt light output power. We don't need more if you make interconnects just uh, um, between one device and the next. And they have very good thermal stability, metal coating, and free of substrate. We published that already quite a few years ago. So we are coming to the end of my talk. So solutions for the future, advanced lasers, drivers, fibers, a topic I did not discuss uh, in this presentation. I didn't have enough time. We are working on that. And receivers will support the rapidly growing internet use, which for which all of you are responsible and will support novel application like blockchain automotive. And at the same time, and here I'm very positive, can control energy consumption, thus supporting sustainable world climate. However, we do not know what the future brings. New challenges will demand new breakthrough, probably novel nanostructural lasers, and then we enter the quantum area. That is my outlook for the future. And this picture should you remind you to a famous Chinese philosopher. Guess who that was? Who said quintessential of scientific research to apply what you discovered. To reach the source of the river, you need to swim against the current. So don't worry if you go your own road and up the hill. Thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you, Dieter, for your very informative and a very impressive talk. I think it covers, uh, covers so many areas from science to device to technology and also the, the future of our uh, data science and the communications. Um, we have um, uh, a bit more than 10 minutes for questions and answers. So we, we do receive some questions from our audience. So. Um, uh, did I have a, one question from my, my, myself first. So, you know, we have really wonderful uh, results and wonderful development in photonics, you know, as you have uh, presented here. And usually photonics can handle data rate and capacity much larger than electronics. But in reality, many uh, functions like, uh, you know, the audio video or the radar and other uh, technologies, they are based on electronics. So I think that's one um, question I have is, uh, how can we interface between photonics and electronics? Will this interface a, a bottleneck or will be there any like, you know, um, a new concepts, how to um, the, the, uh, uh, bridge the mismatch between the two sides? So uh, I don't know if this question is, uh, a kind of um, uh, important question in your research field. Thank you very much uh, for asking this question. Yes, this is a very important question. Because we had until now, we had very separate developments. People, photonic people like me, were working on improving the lasers and adapting the lasers to novel applications coming and coming and coming. But uh, photonics alone is useless. What you need is, of course, electronics, because you have to, for, in order to emit photons, you need a driver. No driver, no photons. 
Now, the development, there was no real development of drivers until now, which tried to merge both the properties, the RC values, for example, of the lasers to the RC values of the driver. Such development was until now not happening. And actually we were some of the first starting it, working together with IBM, we have the first results, working together with a Chinese company and hopefully having, having some results soon. And what we have to do actually, we do not need to invent the wheel. All the technology we need is existing because it's we, we need to apply what we know from memory technology. Memory technology is already very, very far in miniaturization. And we have all over the world, we have excellent companies who can make mass products. And what we have to do is just adapt our know-how, our theoretical know-how for developing high-speed drivers and merge that with the technology which we have for silicon or for silicon on sapphire, for example, that is in particular low impedance. We know all that, but we have to merge the know-how, that's all. This is, of course, a task for several years. It is not going to be done because our silicon engineers, they are not used to go for 30 gigahertz or, or more. Yeah, you need at least 30 gigahertz cutoff frequency of the driver. And the normal silicon CMOS people are not used to that. But we have other people who know how to design high-speed circuits. And we have to bring together the people who are designing high-speed circuits with those who know about the technology, the presently existing technology. Okay, well, That's thank all. you very much for the, you know, for, for the great, uh, you know, uh, thoughts and, and, and uh, something to share with us, your, your uh, wonderful thoughts. And we- and That will, uh, of course, save money, will save yeah. energy and will save money. Because we have, of course, also the environmental questions, and we cannot. Okay, well, that's great. Um, also, we received a question from our audience, and uh, uh, the first question is: uh, One uh, audience asked, uh, you know, your comments on silicon germanium devices and uh, their commercialization in the future. Well, um, we don't know, we have a very good, uh, also in Germany, for example, we have a, a, a well-developed uh, silicon germanic technology, which is presently, which is presently the basis of high-speed high drivers, or can be used as basis for high-speed drivers, but, uh, and that was actually developed by IBM already more than 10 years ago and also in Frankfurt order, uh, not far from Berlin and many other places. But that technology is energy consuming and there are many reasons for that. And silicon CMOS technology, CMOS technology is probably by an order of magnitude um, less energy consuming than uh, um, big mass. Big, big mass is, big mass means uh, bipolar CMOS. It's an uh, integration of a bipolar uh, approach with a CMOS approach. And uh, the opinion of my colleagues in the, in the electronic area are give up big mass and go to CMOS and force the people which will take two to three years and put all their brains into development of fast CMOS. Okay, great. Um, actually, you know, we have one more question from our audience. Um, you mentioned that nano lasers may be needed for on-chip optic interconnects. Could you specifically what kind of uh, characteristics we need 
for that kind of devices, like the you know the volume, power, consumption, it's kind of a specific uh, uh, aspects of the devices or the nano lasers. So do you have uh, some of your thoughts to be shared with our audience? It will be uh, the development going from micro to, to, to nano will be a smooth transition. We are going to make the lasers in the future smaller and smaller. That is imperative because if we want to put our lasers directly on a driver, and that is one of the steps which has to be realized in the next five years. You take off the laser from the gallium arsenide substrate, let's talk about gallium arsenide or indium phosphide substrate, whatever. You put it down, you want to put it down on the driver. But on the driver, you do not have a lot of space. So you must make your laser smaller and that will be going from a pitch of let's say 400 micrometers to 200 micrometers to 20 micrometers probably or size of the laser. And then finally go down to one micrometer or less. And it depends on the application because for many applications, if you just want to make an interconnect across a distance of less than one centimeter, which is presently done by copper, you don't need milliwatts, you need only microwatts. It's a question, of course, also of receiver sensitivity, but it can be done. Microwatts studies have shown that microwatts is enough. Now, the next challenge is none of the people working in this field, including myself, have done high speed tests of such lasers. And that is the next challenge. We must find out what are the properties of nano lasers at high speed. That is the unknown. We do not know. Okay, well, thank you very much. And uh, probably the last question, um, I'd like to ask one question on behalf of our younger colleagues and audience. Uh, you have you know, done a great, a great amount of work in scientific research, in engine development, but also I think you have uh, you know, the uh, ability to integrate your research into a very large social uh, technological background uh, into the bigger needs of this society. So how did you, you know, um, make it possible? Because it's kind of a, not only the you know, knowledge ability, but uh, need a bit of more vision and wisdom in, in, in it. So could you share with some of, you know, of your successful story or thoughts, which made you so successful? So probably kind of like, you know, a, a, good, a good role model for many young scientists. And, uh, you know, as, as the last question of your talk, I'd like to ask this question. Well, uh, there is, of course, uh, imperative is uh, that uh, you do a, a proper job. That means, uh, if you develop a laser or which is already something very complex because you have to know something about quantum wells, fundamental, uh, fundamental properties of nanostructures, you need to know all that. But once you have done that, you should look a little around. Yeah. And look uh, in which systems is that inserted and what are the demands of the society. We cannot kind of, for example, use our internet, pull down my children. They don't have a TV at home anymore. They cannot always pull down about movies. At least I'm talking to them and say, you know how much, how much uh, energy you consume when you pull down, when you use streaming. Yeah, you have to be open. You, have a, you need an open mind as a, as a developer an open mind for the needs of the society. Yeah, a researcher should not kind of be restricted only and go along his yeah, narrow window. The angle, the aperture should be larger. Thank you very much for the question. Well, thank you very much. I think uh, with this, we'd like to thank uh, Professor 
Bimmer again for the wonderful talk. It's very informative and you know, uh, and also his thoughts about how to integrate our efforts and our contribution to the uh, societal and technological impacts. Um, so with this, we you know like to send you uh, all uh, applause for the, you know the, the, this internet. So I'm sure many people like to thank you for the wonderful talk and. Uh, Probably you can see the comments, the feedback in the future. Um, so uh, once again, thank you very much. And uh, with this, I think we uh, move to our next uh, program. Okay. Hi, Professor yeah. Lu. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Don't forget the certification. Yeah. It's oh yes. On yeah, the sorry screen. about this. I think you know, um, you know, to um, recognize your great talk and contribution to this. Uh, uh, platform the I can I can X. So there is a, a certificate for our speakers, and this is uh, the uh, certificate which is now on, on show, shown on screen. Well, thank you for the great contribution to this uh, uh, event, and certainly you know it's your talk is a really a great match with our talks today. It's the 60th anniversary of Laser's invention. And also, um, I think it's like in another aspect is to celebrate the success of uh, the Light Journal, which is now the one of the top three, two or three journals in, in this field. Thank you very much again. And um, I hope that we could uh, meet, meet with you in person and uh, discuss more about uh, your research and the impact into to the future of our life. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. so. Yeah, Alice, do you like to add on yeah. something? Yeah, uh, we want to move to the dialogue part, uh, get everyone on the stage. Yes, it's perfect. Today is a really beautiful day. Yeah, like the world with all this, you know, laser was already 60 years. I think, yeah, all these uh, top scientists are here, they doing so many wonderful works and it's already changing the world. So we like to talk something about this. Okay, Professor Lu, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, I think first of all, we got to thank you, you know, uh, Professor Zhang for uh, the leadership and initiative to create this uh, seminar series. Actually, you know, this is one of my favorite uh, events. Um, it has given so many uh, uh, wonderful talks, speakers. Uh, so one thing is that you know uh, we have a very charming uh, host for the seven cities, Professor Zhang, and uh, so <laughs> you. you know I think it gave the young people uh, the I think the right impression about the researchers. So we have a very charming uh, personality for the researchers. Not only you know they have achievements in the in the uh, in the research field, but also they are very you know uh, great friends and great colleagues. So Professor Zhang, is, I, I can you can represent us as uh, the the uh, the star in, in 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 the social media on science and technology. So um, come back to this uh, panel discussion. We have um, um, three uh, distinguished members. Uh, you know, we we uh, listened to talk by uh, Professor Dieter Bimberg, and also we have uh, Professor Chen Lei Guo. Uh, he just joined us from uh, University. Uh, um, Rochester, and also um, Professor Remy Ma from uh, Peking University. So we have uh, three uh, wonderful uh, panel members for this discussion. And um, uh, so I think the focus is a uh, laser. And certainly, you know, we listen to Dieter about uh, the, the history of lasers invention and their uh, uh, evolving uh, evolvement in the in the past uh, sixty years. So. Actually, you know, with uh, the um, input from uh, Alice, so we decided to focus this uh, uh, discussion on two areas. One is uh, lasers in science. So I just, uh, you know, quickly went through the uh, Nobel Prizes in the past uh, 50 years or so. Mm -hmm. uh, many of them are associated with lasers. So you can see that uh, lasers have contributed a lot in scientific research. And another area is the lasers uh, to the uh, industrial and the commercial applications, uh, which are closely linked to our everyday lives. And so these are the two, two, you know, I'm sure there are many more 
uh, impacts and applications we can mention with lasers. But uh, uh, these are the two uh, things, uh, two areas we like to you know, focus on this discussion. Um, you know, probably we have uh, like a, a Professor Go to greet the audience. Professor Go? Hi. Charlie? Yeah, Charlie, you like to greet the audience? Yeah, you just join us. <laughs> and also, you know, we have yep. a Professor Ma from Peking University. Uh, yeah. So wonderful. So, um, um, you know, I think probably start from a detail because he really, you know, gave us a very comprehensive and systematic review of uh, lasers. So then we have more focus on data and data science and communication. So, um, you tell, so what um, are the lasers in your personal experience uh, in, impression? Peter, can you hear my question? <laughs> okay. Oh. Yeah, it sounds. Can you hear us? Okay. Maybe we we'll go with. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I had a question that uh, so what's a lasers to you? I, I, what yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but who, sh who should reply? Me? Yeah. Yeah, your, <laughs> yeah, your question to you, yes, yeah, first. Yeah. Because you are the only one who see, you know, the laser win the Nobel Prize on site, right? You took that pictures. Yeah. It's yeah. a change of yeah. <laughs> Oh, I, I should kind of uh, share some very personal memory. Uh, Shoris Ivanovich Atherov, who received the Nobel Prize in the year 2000, is one of my best personal friends. And he unfortunately passed away uh, beginning of March uh, last year. Sorry. He's not yeah. with us, um, amongst us anymore. He would have had his 90th birthday. And uh, we did a, a lot of, of development, started to collaborate long time ago, 30 years ago in the 90s, <laughs> when I was uh, traveling a lot to Soviet Union at that time. Yeah. And then later to Russia and went regularly to, to uh, his institute, the Joffe Institute in St. Petersburg. Abraham Joffe is actually the first student of Röntgen who got his PhD in Germany. You see how science is interrelated on a personal basis? I think that is very interesting. And we were figuring out, sitting together hours and hours and hours, new types of lasers. And the last one, the last child, which will be used for these I didn't mention that actually, will be used for the nano lasers. Inside are quantum dots, not quantum wells. Inside are quantum dots. And that is something uh, Alferov and myself developed together. Yeah. And so this is some very personal uh, uh, approach I, I had for many years that a uh, lot of work is based on cooperation, exchange of views. Yeah, exchange of ideas, talking to other people. Science and development is something international, which we should keep in mind, in particular nowadays. That's all. Okay. Well, thank you, Gita. Thank you for your uh, comments and uh, uh, information. So next, uh, we'd like to invite Professor Guo Chunli. Uh, you know, um, you have done a lot of great work, both in very fundamental science and also in applications. So, um, you know, what, so what's your impression or what's, what, what, what are the, uh, you know, the lasers to you, to you in your personal experience and the research field? Yeah, certainly. Um, I think the lasers um, really open up a lot of modern uh, science and technological uh, innovations. Um, uh, with a very short, actually, time span since the invention of the lasers, relatively, it's still a, a rather young technology compared to many well-established, uh, tr more traditional scientific fields. So t this year, we're celebrating 60 uh, years anniversary. Um, but, you know, if you're looking at uh, all these major 
amazing advancements uh, laser has enabled uh, in this past 60 years. And as Yong Feng, you have uh, mentioned earlier, there's, there are many uh, Nobel Prize uh, given to, uh, to uh, either related to laser or the techno technologies enabled by laser, for instance, you know, the invention of the laser itself is, uh, uh, is a prize winning uh, discovery. And later on, there was uh, spectroscopy, holography, you know, cooling and trapping, both Einstein condensation, and to the latest about the CPA, chirp pulse amplifier, mm -hmm. and all uh, directly or are somewhat indirectly related to, to the laser. So um, I think the laser, um, itself uh, really opened up a tremendous opportunity for us uh, to use both for basic science as well as applications. Well, thank, thank you, Charlie, for your input. Certainly, you know, it's, uh, your, your work itself is kind of a good reflection how uh, important the lasers are in, uh, in both in research and in our daily life. So later, we have a turn late to give us a presentation. Uh, before that, we'd like to move to Professor Remy Ma, and you're the youngest uh, <laughs> uh, among the, you know, the speakers, um, and uh, you, you, you represent the future of uh, la laser application science and technology. So, um, so you know, what, what's, what's your view on lasers? Thank you, uh, Professor Lu. So, um, yeah, I'm the youngest here. I, I have been working on this for about uh, um, 13 years. And also, I taught the laser physics here in our department at the Peking University. And I think for me, it's very clear. I think laser is the, one of the most important invention in our, our past centuries. I think it's very difficult to overstate the impact of the laser on our society, on our science, and everyday life. I think perhaps uh, you will agree with me that you know, laser is an invention that kind of uh, elevated our civilization level. And we're talking uh, right now, uh, the signal carried by the uh, light emitted by lasers, like uh, passing through uh, the continents and reach to the every corner of our, our audience in the world. And we uh, also, like uh, we see, like uh, uh, we have most uh, powerful laser, like uh, the National Ignition Facility. Um, that it can bring the star power to the Earth, so it potentially can shift the nuclear fusion. Also, at another extreme, right now we have this nanoscale laser, as Professor Bingwood already uh, introduced. Right now, the smallest laser we can make is already with a uh, size only tenth of a nanometer, comparable to the feature size of our transistor. People can put a, a nanoscale laser inside a cell. And do the tracking, labeling, and also even do uh, some more therapy, like cure cancer, like something like that. So for me, like leaders are kind of uh, intelligent and living creatures for me. Actually, sometimes I felt uh, they can guide me to the most beautiful underlying fix, not, uh, not uh, I, I just need to follow, follow it and uh, to find uh, like what's uh, exciting over there. So I think laser for me, it's probably it's, uh, will be my uh, lifelong research topic. I really <laughs> <laughs> That's a promise. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Wonderful, for being, I think you, you, you know, um, if you are um, talking for getting Nobel Prize, you are in the right field. Just if you look at the, uh, you know, the Nobel Prize in uh, physics, uh, uh, chemistry, and uh, 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 the medicine, I think my my impression is that around one, at least one third of them are regarding lasers or mm -hmm. some, some applications uh, enabled by lasers. So I think uh, uh, certainly, you know, lasers are uh, a kind of a gift from the God in, 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 the, in the technology history. And uh, we, we have these wonderful tools for many things, but not only uh, in the science, you know, everyday life, we are, have been benefited by lasers um, a mm -hmm. lot. And uh, one example is uh, probably, you know, um, you uh, have uh, also mentioned in the beginning, uh, w before we start this uh, uh, webinar, is about a cell phone. So we are making everything smaller and smaller. So the traditional machining technology, you know, uh, like you know, cutting, uh, drilling by drill bits and a knife, they're not possible anymore because the dimensions are so small. 
they are well below one millimeter. So it's kind of mm -hmm. a, a fraction of a, a human hair size. So all these are now being enabled by lasers. For example, uh, if you open up uh, an iPhone, I'm sure you can find the hundreds of places they, you know, treated by lasers uh, mm -hmm. for drilling, for packaging, for patterning. Uh, all these are enabled by lasers. So without lasers, we cannot have, have iPhone. And probably, you know, a few years back, we all used a CD room, right? The CD rooms are driven by laser files, so also laser applications. And now the airplanes, we are moving from uh, uh, aluminum based to five, uh, carbon fiber based uh, materials. Mm -hmm. Carbon fibers are extremely strong. You cannot really drill and cut it. If you drill it, then you are, you, you are pulling the carbon fibers, you, you are damaging the material structures. The laser can remove materials without, you know, uh, the constraint of mechanical uh, machining. Uh, so, and also, you know, probably we talked about a lot about uh, uh, lithography for semiconductors. So, um, EUV, extreme UV light, yes. EUV uh, lithography, they are all based on laser technology. So, um, and probably the last one, uh, I think you know, many people traveling in China are impressed by the um, uh, high speed trains, right? The, the, <laughs> The high-speed trains are really, you know, uh, to me, it's really uh, kind of like a joy to to travel in China uh, through the uh, <laughs> trains. So I, you know, I don't know if uh, Peter, you agree that I prefer now trains rather than airplanes once we have the exactly. You know, the yeah, everyone wants uh, to travel by high-speed trains. <laughs> yeah, I think lasers are also playing important roles for welding and for because the paint paint paintings have to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did it turn on your microphone? Your microphone was mute. Yeah, yeah. is it okay? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I like yeah, I, I like the high speed. I have used several times the high speed train in China. It's yeah, it's actually better than the European lately, ones in the meantime. Uh, uh, use in, I like it. Uh, in 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 the uh the high speed trains, for example, you know there are researchers researchers working on how to. Uh, improve the wearing resistance of the rails okay. for high speed train because high speed train has a, a stronger impact on the rails and the we uh, we a rail wearing becomes issue. And uh, now they, they are using laser to cause uh, phase transformation to make them more uh, resistant to uh, wearing. So they improve the lifetime of rails and improve the uh, safety and uh, uh, e economical performance. So. There are so many things we can, um, um, you know, use lasers. So you know, there are also challenges of the laser uh, business or technology, to my opinion. One is the standardization. So now lasers are still the tools for ex experts. But in fact, actually lasers uh, should be simpler than uh, cars, right? And uh, we all can drive cars, but uh, not everyone else can use lasers. I think. Uh, Laser needs to be standardized so to make it a plug and play and to make it easy to use. That's one thing. Second thing is that you know we need to make lasers more cost effective. And the lasers mm -hmm. are simpler than the cars. That's that's my personal uh, opinion, certainly. But uh, still, lasers are uh, comparing with other tools, they are still a bit more costly. So I'm sure this, uh, you know, with uh, the efforts by industry, this uh, trend is that uh, you know the performance is going high. Very quickly, and also the price is becoming more affordable in the, in 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 the, in the uh, past few years. And the last one is, I think the I you know I really impressed by the uh, fiber lasers. Mm -hmm. They are becoming smarter because now we can program the lasers. So one single laser can be used for different purposes. That's kind of I think a right trend, just like computers. Now computers, I think a can be used for many things by one platform. And the lasers are also becoming this kind of platform, in my opinion. So I think uh, there are a lot um, more opportunities we, we can uh, expect for the lasers. I think uh, the 60 uh, years in Chinese subculture is a very special year. Right? 60 is, uh, they call it the Huajia. Basically, it's a one round of uh, you know, zodiac uh, years. That means it's a one round of uh, uh, 
kind of for like, you know, life. So anyone live beyond 60 is kind of an, a newborn person. You can, you know, go to the next stage of your life. And I'm sure <laughs> lasers are, you know, mature, but also yes. I think it's a start point of a new life. So, you know, I, I think we are all excited about la lasers. And uh, so probably, you know, at the, before we conclude our panel discussion, I'd like to see if uh, any of our um, members can give us a few more words about this. And then we pass the time to Alice for next speaker. Okay. Yeah. So, Dieter, would you like to give a one, one uh, message to our audience, or especially for young people? Uh, lasers, coming back to one of the famous Chinese leaders, Mao Zedong, who was <laughs> saying, let, have, let us have 100 flowers, probably 1,000 flowers on a meadow. Yeah. <laughs> and that is what you mentioned in your last five minutes. It's such a wide field. Electronics is so easy. Everybody talks about random access, about memories. There are only two types of important devices. Lasers is much more colorful. And that makes a difference. And that is why probably lasers are less known than uh, everything else. Although they are much more important. Today, photonics, industry-wise, has much, much more importance than electronics. Mm -hmm. There is no device today which has no, phot no photonic devices inside. That is my concluding remark. Let's go back to Chairman Mao and consider his <laughs> prediction about the flowers. That was a, a very good one. Okay. Well, thank you for your remarks. And certainly, you know, uh, that gave us uh, different thoughts. So with this, we'd like to conclude this uh, panel discussion. And uh, I'd like to give the time back to Alice for her to uh, the chair the next talk. OK, thank you all of you very much. Yeah, for well, laser already changing the world. Actually, not only, you know, for the Auto, you know, uh, issues, the research is also related with all other fields. Like I've been working at the electronic field, the microelectronic field. So we use lasers for fabrication. We design, you know, different kind of devices with all these, you know, lasers, so the fibers or something like this. So it's really clarified. Yeah, I think the future, will be very bright. I think collaborate, uh, you know, with a different field and uh, to develop a lot of things here, yeah, will be in the next uh, 60 years to go. Like uh, my Renmi already say that, right? Yeah, will be a long life, right? Lifetime research. So that's just a start. Okay, thank you all of you very much. Uh, we move to the next, uh, Speaker is uh, our youngest one, Ren Min Ma. Yeah. So, oh, so sorry. Uh, yeah, we we got 